welcome to Voices from the Left. I'm your host, Craig. Thanks for listening. Our quote. The liberty of man consists solely in this, that he obeys natural laws because he has himself recognized them as such, and not because they have been externally imposed upon him by any extrinsic will whatever, divine or human, collective or individual. Mikhail Bakunin. I'm joined today by the crew of the podcast 805 Uncensored, and we'll be discussing the life and influence of Emma Goldman, noted anarchist and feminist. Without further ado, you guys can introduce yourselves and we'll get rolling. Yeah, I'll go first. Thanks so much, Craig, for having us. Um, my name is Jordan. And I'm the host of 805 Uncensored. I created the podcast back in 2019. Politically, I identify as an anarcho-communist and pretty much just focus on spreading awareness about um, tackling systemic oppression. Uh, we talk about music, spirituality, philosophy, and a variety of topics. So yeah, thank you again for having me. I guess I'll go next. <laughs> My name is Heather. Uh, I joined the podcast uh, about a year ago. And uh, my day job is I do public policy uh, consulting work. And uh, yeah, I don't really identify as any um, political party or ideology. I actually am anti-party. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. You bet. Thank you. Um, And I think Camilla is in the car and driving, so I don't know that we'll get an intro from her but uh yeah i don't think she was gonna participate yeah that's fine (laughs) no worries um so anyway thank you guys uh for joining me and uh you know i'll let let you guys take it away yeah so first of all thank you for letting me present on emma goldman she's an intellectual hero of mine has been a, a tremendous influence on my political development over the last few years. And I'm, I'm thrilled to do this. So it's a, it's a pleasure. Awesome. Man. Yeah. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm looking forward to learning cause I do not know much about Emma Gold. <laughs> so I, I, whenever I do um, a presentation on a historical figure, I like to do kind of a brief introduction on them and just kind of outline some of the characteristics of them and really what stood out as a person how they stood out as a person. Um, So first things first, Emma Goldman was many things, an extraordinary speaker, revolutionary, feminist, writer, but above all, she was an anarchist, an extremely passionate one at that. She was considered an anarchist and a radical, even among fellow anarchists. So, you know, that kind of shows how radical she was. She was a woman who fought systemic oppression, exploitation, the patriarchy, capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism tooth and nail, every ounce of her heart and soul. She wrote on the subject of anarchism. Anarchism then really stands for the liberation of the human mind from the dominion of religion, the liberation of the human body from the dominion of property, liberation from the shackles and restraint of government. Anarchism stands for a social order based on the free grouping of individuals for the purpose of producing real social wealth, an order that will guarantee to every human being free access to the earth and full enjoyment of the necessities of life, according to individual desires, tastes, and inclinations. As far as uh, Emma Goldman's early life goes, she was born in Connes in Lithuania which was at the time part of the Russian Empire, to an Orthodox Lithuanian Jewish family on June 27th, 1869. So she was a Gemini (laughs) for my spiritual listeners out there. Uh, Her family emigrated to the United States in 1885, specifically to Rochester, New York, which is in upstate New York. As far as her anarchist origins go, Uh, They were originally inspired by the Haymarket Affair, which took place in 1886 in Chicago, Illinois. For your listeners that are not necessarily aware of the Haymarket Affair, uh, this was a riot um, and the aftermath of a bombing that took place on May 4th, 1886. 
in a rally that was filled with workers that were advocating for the eight hour workday. And basically an unknown assailant threw a bomb into the crowd and the police did what they do. And they just started fucking shooting people and they ended up killing seven of their own, uh, four civilians and wounding 12 other people. Ultimately, uh, anarchists took the scapegoat and eight anarchists were charged and all eight were convicted of conspiracy. And it's generally considered the origin of International Workers' Day. And uh, just a brief side note, uh, you notice that we have International Workers' Day, we have May Day, and then we also have Labor Day. The reason that we have Labor Day in the United States is because Grover Cleveland, when he was president, wanted to distance the United States <laughs> from having a Worker Solidarity Day. So he wanted to spread it out as far as possible and put it in September instead of, you know, in recognition with International Workers Day in May. So that's the reason that we have that. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. So it's all just class warfare. Yeah. The, ru the ruling class cracking down on the workers as we see throughout history. Right. Um, so Back to the Haymarket affair, an unknown assailant threw a dynamite bomb at the police. Uh, eight anarchists were charged, and this event and the ensuing action via the prosecution of the anarchists were the main driving force of Emma Goldman's politics. So right. after the riot, she began writing on anarchist philosophy, women's rights, and social issues, which uh, were really popular. She would often attract thousands of supporters to her rallies. Awesome. And her and her lover, Alexander Berkman, whom she met in New York City, they conspired in 1892 to assassinate a prominent businessman, Henry Clay Frick. Um, I want to say he was the chairman of the Carnegie uh, Steel Company. That sounds right. Yeah, and this was during the Homestead Strike, also known as the Homestead Massacre. Uh, listeners out there, research this event if you don't know about it already. <laughs> really big, really big event in the labor struggle. Yeah. The failed assassination attempt led to the conviction and imprisonment of Berkman, though, for 14 years. And his experience in prison inspired his memoir, which was Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. And I wanted to just read this... Um, this little excerpt from Howard Zen's A People's History of the United States, mm. uh, the Socialist Challenge chapter, Goldman wrote while in prison, uh, a passionate speech speaking out against the Spanish Empire. Mm. She said, um, how our hearts burned with indignation against the atrocious Spaniards. But when the smoke was over, the dead buried, and the cost of the war came back to the people in an increase in the price of commodities and rent. That is, when we sobered up from our own patriotic spree, it suddenly dawned on us that the cause of the Spanish-American War was the price of sugar, that the lives, blood, and money of the American people were used to protect the interests of the American capitalists. Of course. So Goldman and Berkman, however, did remain lovers for the entire duration of Berkman's prison term. And when he was released from prison, he became the editor of Goldman's journal, which was titled Mother Earth. And he would later create his own journal, which was called The Blast. And in 1917, Goldman and Berkman uh, were sentenced to two years in jail for conspiracy against the draft. This was uh, out of World War One, And uh, technically, this was called the Selective Service Act of 1917. This required all males aged 21 to 30 to register for military conscription. And Goldman saw the decision as an exercise of imperialist aggression, which was purely driven by capitalism. She declared in Mother Earth her intent to resist conscription and to oppose U.S. involvement in the war. To this end, she and Berkman organized the No Conscription League of New York, 
which proclaimed, we oppose conscription because we are internationalists, anti-militarists, and opposed to all wars waged by capitalistic governments. She wrote specifically about World War I. We say that if America has entered the war to make the world safe for democracy, she must first make democracy safe in America. How else in the world to take America seriously when democracy at home is daily being outraged, free speech suppressed, peaceable assemblies broken up by overbearing and brutal gangsters in uniform, the police, when free press is curtailed and every independent opinion gagged, verify, uh, verily, rather, poor as we are in democracy, how can we give it to the world? So... That's about as timeless today as it could be. (laughs) Right? Yeah. After the couple uh, was released from prison, Goldman and Berkman would immediately be arrested in the Palmer Raids of 1917, along with 248 other people during uh, America's first Red Scare. Berkman and Goldman were both deported to Russia, ultimately, two years later, in December of 1919. And, you know, this is because they were wrapped up in supporting the Russian Revolution and the Bolsheviks. And I'm going to get to that right now. So, initially, she was a supporter of the Russian Revolution. She, however, changed her stance after the crushing of the Kronstadt Rebellion. By the Bolsheviks. Another event your listeners should read up on if they're not aware. Uh, Goldman left the Soviet Union ultimately four years later in 1923, and she wrote about her experiences in her work uh, titled My Disillusionment in Russia. While splitting time in England, Canada, and France, she wrote her autobiography, which was titled Living My Life. Uh, She wrote in her journal that despite its dependence on communist government, talking about the Soviet Union, it represented the most fundamental, far-reaching, and all-embracing principles of human freedom and of economic well-being. By the time she neared Europe, she expressed fears about what was to come. She was worried about the ongoing Russian civil war and the possibility of it being seized by anti-Bolshevik forces. The state, anti-capitalist though it was, also posed a threat. I could never in my life work within the confines of the state, she wrote to her niece, Bolshevist or otherwise. She quickly discovered that her fears were justified. Days after returning to Petrograd, which is modern-day St. Petersburg, she was shocked to hear a party official refer to free speech as a bourgeois superstition. As she and Berkman traveled around the country, they found repression, mismanagement, and corruption. Instead of the equality and worker empowerment they dreamed of, those who questioned the government were demonized as counter-revolutionaries, and workers labored under severe conditions. They met with Vladimir Lenin, which I, I found this very interesting when I was doing this research, that they actually met with Lenin. Yeah, Uh, Berkman and Goldman. And he assured them that the government suppression of free press liberties was justified. He told them that there can be no free speech in a revolutionary period. Berkman was more willing to forgive the government's actions in the name of historical necessity, but he eventually joined Goldman in opposing the Soviet state's authority. And a a slight change of topic, but just an overall um, really good summary about how she viewed the role of the state and how she viewed that that voting would not necessarily liberate women. Uh, This is once again from the socialist chapter of Howard Zenn's A People's History of the United States. Uh, She wrote... um, us modern fe- our modern fetish is universal suffrage. The women of Australia and New Zealand can vote and and help make the laws. And the labor condition and how are the labor conditions there? 
The history of the political activities of man proves that they have given, um, but absolutely nothing could not have achieved in a more direct manner. As a matter of fact, every inch of ground he has gained has been through a constant fight, a ceaseless struggle for self-assertion uh, and not through suffrage. There is no reason what whatsoever to assume the woman in her climb to emancipation has been or will be helped by the ballot. Her development, her freedom, her independence must come from and through herself, first by asserting herself as a personality, second by refusing uh, the right to anyone over her body, by refusing to her children unless she wants them, by refusing to be a servant to God, the state, society, the husband, the family, etc., by making her life simpler but deeper and nicer. Only that and not the ballot will set women free. Now, just to be clear, she's not talking about postponing the changing of women's conditions to some like futurist socialist society. She wanted more direct, immediate action. So just let's stop for a minute and just talk about uh, timing of some of these things, because we have a whole bunch of things converging here, right? We've got the mm -hmm. October Revolution of, of Lenin from, from 1917, right? Yep. You've got uh, the women's suffrage movement in the United States, which was what, 1919, right? Yes. Yep. So those are coinciding almost while they're talking to each other, right? Like mm -hmm. meeting and talking, I think you said. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, and then you have um, obviously Hitler's working on coming to power at this time. He's in the middle of, you know, whatever his, you know, entry level to the party was. So there's a whole bunch of stuff happening here right after World War One. Right. Yeah. And then the same year, the women's suffrage movement is really coming to full steam in the United States. Uh, Goldman and Bergman are once again de uh, deported to Russia in 1919. Right. Right. So and then right now. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Spanish Civil War, which takes place in the 1930s. And, you know, ultimately that leads to the, the fascist uh, Franco. Yeah. <clears throat> so after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, uh, Goldman relocated to Spain to support the anarchists. Goldman was welcomed with open arms in Spain and joined the Confederacion uh, Nacional del Trabajo and Federacion uh, Anarchista Ibarica organizations, and for the first time in her life, lived in a community run by and for anarchists, according to true anarchist principles. Uh, she wrote, In all my life, I have not been met with such warm hospitality, camaraderie, and solidarity. After touring a series of collectives in the province of Huesca, she told a group of workers, quote, your revolution will destroy forever the notion that anarchism stands for chaos, end quote. She began editing the weekly CNNT FAI information bulletin and responded to English language uh, mail. What, question for you real quick. Uh -huh. Those two parties that you mentioned, uh, the Confederacion Nacional del Trabajo and the Anarchista Iberica were yeah. either one of those the ones that Orwell joined when he fought in the Spanish Civil War or was he did he join something different do you know uh you know what I I don't know I feel like he might have joined one of those because I know that he was deeply involved in the anarchist movement in Spain as well uh I, I would have to research that though gotcha good question um, so she's, yeah, basically she talks about the revolution will destroy the notion that the anarchism stands for chaos. Uh, she begins to worry about the future of Spain's anarchism. However, um, when the CNNT FII joined a coalition government in 1937 against the core anarchist principle of abstaining from state structures. And, and of course, this is this is in in attempts to to create solidarity because a fascist is rising to power but 
more distressingly, uh, there was repeated concessions by uh, to, to communist forces in the name of uniting against fascism. And, and she wrote in November of 36 that cooperating with communists in Spain was a denial of our comrades in Stalin's concentration camps. Because remember, she, she experienced life in, in Bolshevist Russia. She knew what it was like in, in the Soviet Union. Right. Um, so she had very strong feelings about the Soviet Union and Russia in general. Uh, the USSR, meanwhile, refused to send weapons to the anarchist forces in Spain. And disinformation campaigns were being waged against the anarchists across Europe and the U.S. And her faith in the movement unshaken, she returned to London as an official representative of the CNNT FAI. Uh, so fast forward to next year in May of 1937. There were communist-led forces that attacked anarchist strongholds and broke up agrarian collectives. Newspapers in England and elsewhere accepted the timeline of events offered by the Second Spanish Republic at the face value. Oh, here we go. George Orwell. <laughs> Journalist George Orwell, present for the crackdown, wrote, The accounts of the Barcelona riots in May beat everything I have ever seen for lying. <laughs> That's pretty great. Uh, Goldman returns to Spain uh, in September. But the CNNT FAI appeared to her like people in a burning house. Uh, worse, anarchists and other radicals around the world refused to support their cause, and the nationalist forces declared victory in Spain just before she returned to London. Uh, she was frustrated by England's repressive atmosphere, which she called more fascist than the fascists. Very interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. She was such a badass. Yeah. She returned to Canada in 1939. Her service to the anarchist cause in Spain was never forgotten. And on her seven, 70th birthday, uh, the former secretary general of the CNNT FAI, Mariana Vasquez, sent a message to her from Paris, praising her for her contributions and naming her as our spiritual mother. She called it the most beautiful tribute that she had ever received. That's great. The uh, <laughs> what she said about going back to England, that was, you know, that was what in the 1930s still. So you've got capitalism raging. You've got colonialism raging still. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it makes sense that. I think most people listening to this will understand that, you know, the end of capitalism is fascism. Right. That's the end goal. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so we just did a presentation on Upton Sinclair, and okay. he says that fascism is capitalism plus murder. <laughs> Checks out. Yep. So, okay, where was I at? Um, yeah. As the events preceded World War II uh, began to unfold in Europe. So, yeah, we're now at the end of the 1930s and we're getting into World War II. She reiterated her opposition to wars that were waged by governments. Much as I loathe Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, and Franco, she wrote to a friend, I would not support a war against them and for the democracies which, in the last analysis, are only fascist in disguise. So, in her view... The only difference between Nazi Germany and like the United States, France, etc., yeah. were the fact that the Nazis were outwardly fascist, but these so-called democracies, these neoliberal regimes, even at the time, were really just fascists because um, she felt that Britain and France had missed their opportunity to oppose fascism. And that the coming war would only result in a new form of madness in the world, which ultimately she was right, because decades of the Cold War and the fucking constant threat of nuclear war, which we still see to this day. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Uh, is is completely exemplified by by the fallout of World War Two. Right. Well, and you've got, you know, like my people, my parents age, the boomers, quote unquote. And the older Gen Xers, they were traumatized by all the 
CIA propaganda during the Red Scare, right? Like they don't, you know, I, I was, I don't know, eight when the Berlin Wall fell. So, you know, Gorbachev was just a guy with the funny <laughs> birthmark, right? I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't know any of it, right? But all my parents, they're, you know, they all lived through just the, that constant propaganda. So I totally see what she's saying there. Yeah. <clears throat> so she dies actually before the war is uh, is over. On Saturday, February 17, 1940, she actually suffered a debilitating stroke. She became paralyzed on her right side, and although her hearing was unaffected, she could not speak. And one of her friends described it uh, by saying just to think that here was Emma, the greatest orator in America, unable to utter one word. For three months, she improved slightly, receiving visitors, and on one occasion, uh, one word, for three months, uh, sorry, <laughs> excuse me, on one occasion, gesturing to her address book to signal that a friend might find friendly contacts during a trip to Mexico. Um, she suffered another stroke on May 8th, and she died six days later in Toronto at the age of 70. Um, the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service allowed her body to be brought back to the U.S., and she was buried in German Waldheim Cemetery, which is now named Forest Home Cemetery in Forest Park, Illinois, mm -hmm. which is a western suburb of Chicago, uh, near the graves of those that were executed after the Haymarket Affair. And, and the the base relief on her grave marker was created by sculptor Joe Davidson, and the stone includes the quote, Liberty will not descend to a people. A people must raise themselves to liberty. That's great. Yeah. So that's that that was Emma Goldman's life, and those were her, her main contributions to, to anarchism and, and feminism and I'll, I'll cover a little bit more of that when I summarize everything but what are some of your responses to that what do you what do you make of it yeah so uh I like what she said about women the women's suffrage movement right mm -hmm. like voting was a step of it right a, a step a step to liberation right but it wasn't the end of the liber the liberation right I think yeah. that's what she was getting at for the most part. Um, and I like, I was thinking about when you mentioned she motioned to her address book about someone who might find friendly contacts to Mexico. Yeah. That was in the four, like early forties, right? Cause she died before the end of world war two. <clears throat> yeah so, so she dies in early 1940 yeah wasn't that is that around the time Frida Kahlo was uh doing what she was doing in Mexico do you think that's what she was talking about it, it's possible because that's that's immediately who came to mind for me yeah interesting and then of course uh Trotsky gets executed in Mexico while he's right. with Frida Kahlo. I mean, he wasn't with her when he got executed, but he was with her in terms of like a relationship. Gets yeah. fucking assassinated with an ice pick. <laughs> right. Jesus. Um, absolutely brutal. Yeah. Just uh, the other thing I, I thought about, you mentioned um, the homestead strike. Yeah. So just so. You know, yes, you're right, 100% correct. Listeners need to, if they don't know what that is, you need to go look it up and <laughs> find out what it is because this was uh, Carnegie Steel. This was uh, converging with the Pinkerton Agency to try and break up this strike. And it went really poorly for the Pinkerton Agency, which is great. Like they ended up getting some of themselves killed trying to break up the strikers, <laughs> the people at the steel mine. <laughs> or the steel factory that yeah. were on strike or, or threatening to go on strike. Right. They ended up getting mm -hmm. themselves killed. It was like a huge black eye on 
<laughs> for the Pinkerton agency, which was pretty great because those guys suck. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting that uh, you, you brought up the homestead strike. And I didn't know that about it, that part of it. I, I did a little bit of research myself into the, the Pinkerton agency. So I, I was just like, huh, how all that shit's <laughs> coming together. It's crazy. Yeah, it it really is. Um, yeah. There is a, a long history of labor struggle in the United States. Yeah. And, you know, this is obvious to leftists, but it's just flat out not taught in, in U.S. schools. Right. It's not everything uh, in, in terms of like political um, efficacy in the United States, I feel like is so heavily intellectualized versus taught in a way that's that's understandable and, and meant in a way that would actually, you know, advance the interests of advance the material conditions of the working class, which is obviously just antithetical to the ruling class and everybody that runs the status quo. Right. So it's and it's interesting um, reading novels, you know, reading historical accounts like uh, Howard Zenz of People's History of the United States because it it breaks down a working class struggle sure. um, about history. And right. then like Roxanne uh, Dunbar, she talks about uh, the indigenous people's history of the United States mm. uh, purely from an indigenous perspective, which obviously is not ever taught. <laughs> right. Very little of it. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Um, the other thing I, I that struck me was when you were talking about uh goldman and berkman not agreeing with lenin about suppressing this the speech yes um and you know i i think everybody understands why he was doing that because he was trying to i think anyway in my very limited reading of what was happening then was he's trying to root out the people in the party that are going to try and take him down, right? The Trotskyists mm -hmm. and people like that, right? So he was doing yes. that. I'm not saying that was right or wrong that he did that. I'm just saying I think that's why that he was doing that. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, it sounds like they were, they did, you know, Goldman and Berkman didn't want the government meddling in any of that, right? That's the whole idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they rejected, um, having a state apparatus right leading to uh communism right because they're they're anarchists yeah and yeah it's it's very interesting to consider that because i actually i'm a big emma goldman fan and i didn't even know that she had actually met with lenin until i did the research for this episode hmm. um so I one thing that I read just from Franz Fanon, he was an an Afro uh, Caribbean psychiatrist, uh, political philosopher, and and Marxist from the French colony of Martinique. He wrote about um, just the kind of the connection of anarchism, intersectionality, and decolonization feedback loop that decolonization never takes place unnoticed for it focuses on and fundamentally alters being and transforms the spectator crushed to a non-essential state into a privileged actor captured in a virtually grandiose fashion by the spotlight of history it infuses a new rhythm specific to a new generation of human with a new language and a new humanity <clears throat> Decolonization is truly the creation of new humans, but such a creation cannot be attributed to a supernatural power. The thing colonized becomes a human through the very process of liberation. Is that from uh, The Wretched of the Earth? Uh, I don't know, actually. Okay. That's on my reading list, too. I haven't got to it yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. I have so many fucking books on my yeah. list, man. I do too. But yeah, that's a that's a great quote. I like that. So just a note on anarcho-feminism and sexuality. Uh, by the way, just for your listeners' sake, Goldman is considered the chief founder of anarcho-feminism, the school of anarchist thought, uh, because anarchism 
has a variety of philosophies within itself. Uh, Anarcho-feminism combined the elements of anarchism to an analysis that was concentrated on women's oppression, arguing that the state is inherently patriarchal, as is women's experiences as nurturers and caregivers. Anarchism first emerged as a political current at a time when gender equality was systematically enforced and women were excluded from public life. Their existence was confined to the traditional gender roles of mothers and wives within the construct of the nuclear family. In particular, working class women were both politically and economically disenfranchised, which drove them closer to socialism and political militancy. Uh, Anarcho-feminism has a diverse range of thought, but is generally characterized by the principles of women's autonomy, free love, and intersectionality. Anarcho-feminists are committed to women's empowerment in social and political life, opposing capitalism and the state as key instruments of institutional discrimination against women. Um, a note on Emma Goldman's legacy. She was considered in the United States, among other things. Uh, this is a straight up quote. I want to say this came from J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, who was, of course, the first chief of the FBI and the agency that preceded the FBI as well. I'm drawing a blank on what that was called right now. But anyways, uh, she was considered the most dangerous woman in America. Historian Vivian Gornick said about her, uh, hers was the sensibility, not of the intellectual, but of the artist, dramatizing for others what they could hardly articulate for themselves. Activist Cynthia Cooper um, on uh, this was a piece called Settled Issues for Women and Emma Goldman's Bravery. Uh, she was asked, What do you think some of the most pressing issues for women are today? And she responded by saying, Distraction, overload, and paralysis are the most pressing issues for women today. So many people are busy trying to get by or keep up or they only become engaged in a fake world of entertainment and celebrity. When that happens, they don't have an opportunity to shape decisions of the times. Sadly, other forces are willing to take advantage of, the, of that disengagement. And as Emma Goldman said, let us not overlook vital things because of the bulk of trifles confronting us. Many quote unquote settled issues have come back into play. Reactionaries who want to push back our rights are a minority, but they have managed to co-opt politics and to box in our rights. It's easy to do nothing if we aren't aroused, something Emma Goldman was very good at doing. Many of the rights that we've taken for granted for the past 20 to 100 years are being undermined, sometimes in quiet ways that move us back an inch or two, and sometimes a mile. Challenges to bodily integrity, reproductive freedom, access to abortion, contraception, child-rearing assistance, sexual expression, and the right to privacy. Attacks on cultural dignity, environmental health, diversity, economic security, freedom from gender violence, equal representation in public leadership, parity in the arts, media, and the private sector, and even on voting. There are forces working actively to encroach on women's human rights. Neglect your rights and they'll go away. Emma Goldman once said, people have only as much liberty as they have the intelligence to want and the courage to take. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that's really yeah. good. I'll, I'll, like I'll take that. a sip to that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <clears throat> it, it, it brings to mind what I've thought for a while and you know, depending on who you talk to, they'll, they look at it the other way, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, protesting, especially in the United States is the most patriotic thing you can do. Yeah. Because you are exercising your rights to do, to do, to do that. Right. And to say, Hey, we don't like what you're doing. <laughs> you guys are full of shit. Right. Like that was, that was the whole point of having freedom of assembly right and freedom of speech so that you could have make change right 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the most patriotic thing that you can do is speak out against the government, especially one that's tyrannical. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Heather, did you have something that you wanted to say before I just kind of wrap up? Yeah, actually, it's on that point about speaking up. And if you like, I mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, she was, you know, talking about stuff that is applicable today, right? Yep. Like mm -hmm. in so many ways, uh, as you're just talking about this, I'm just thinking like, oh, my God, like, you know, you're talking about what's going on right now. <laughs> but, uh, but I think I think uh, especially to the point about like, uh, you know, especially like American democracy. Right. Um, yeah. I totally and 100. I mean, Jordan, you know this. Like, I think that this country is full on in fascism. Um, yeah. And and on the topic of protest and, you know, being patriotic by speaking up against government like we're not allowed to do that anymore you know um yep. you you speak up against the government and you're on some list <laughs> right yep. you're tweeting or you're on facebook and you're you're talking yep. about how you don't like joe biden you're on a list or you don't like donald trump you're on a list and then like we even have like these micro like fascisms inside groups like the the democratic party and the republican party there is no room um, to to do like that patriotic thing of speaking out against what you think right. is an injustice. Um, yeah. And so I think that she was like ahead of her time or just nothing has changed. Right. Yeah. Um, I think uh, and both. Then other, yeah, exactly. And then the other mm -hmm. comment that I have is just like, I just think it's so interesting how like you have all of these like major events going on and we never learn about these figures, but they were like so important to the story. Um, and so I actually just appreciate like this episode, right? Because it raises awareness of someone everyone should know about. Right. Right. You know? Yep. Everyone. Everyone yeah. should know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Those and are my those are my thoughts. <laughs> no, that's that's great. And it what you're what you're just talking about goes i think about how people might not know who emma goldman is i didn't know who she was till very recently <laughs> um and i think it goes back to what what he read in here about the misinformation and disinformation mm -hmm. that she and berkman saw coming out of i think it was the spanish civil war part yeah. um you know in the united states was the all in on that propaganda you know that yeah. Right, because the United States would rather have a fascist dictator like Franco in there, who yep. will you know help quote protect United States interest in the area, than to have you know anything else. Right? Yeah, so. the United States has a long history of supporting fascistic dictatorships yeah. all yeah. over the place, the entire globe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so so many coups, so many coups. But I think, but I think to the, to the point that you, 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 you said she made is like, you know, people like Hitler, uh, Mussolini, like they were, they were so outward about it. Right. But yeah. in, in the U S we're, we're inward about it. And that's how people don't necessarily know. Right. 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 Uh, With the exception of Trump. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah he's just an in-your-face fascist right <laughs> yeah joe joe biden's diet fascist yeah yeah well it's more it's more i guess maybe low-key is my the wrong word but that's kind of how i see it uh, yeah. as, as far as just like the fascism that comes from from the capitalism in the united states yeah right mm -hmm. like you know dress codes and you know now you can't work from home everybody's got to be in the building well, why do people need to be in the building? Well, because uh, they give you some <laughs> reason, right? And it's like, no, it's because whoever owns this building wants to make sure it keeps its value. And yeah. that's yeah. all this is about. It has nothing to do with, <laughs> with you know, working together, collaborating, any of that bullshit, right? Like, yeah, it's, no, fuck it's no. not they that. Need to, they need to justify corporate office leases. Yeah, it's commercial landlords. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, what, that's what that whole thing is about. It's just utter nonsense utter nonsense but you know and it and it happens 
you know, all over the place, right? They yeah. just in general in the United, all over the, you know, I'm sure in Britain and Europe and every and other places too, but in the United States in particular, you have, we've seen it a lot in the last 20 years, but I'm sure it was happening before that when I, when I just wasn't paying attention. Um, mm-hmm. But you have um, privatizing gains and socializing losses. Yeah. by corporations right we see it with yeah. saw it with the car companies in 07 right we saw it with the banks in 07 08 we in every other time since then we saw it with the airline companies during covid airlines yes that's a prime example right they need money so they don't go under why <laughs> i know that's that's anti-capitalist let them go under <laughs> Let them, yeah. yeah. yeah let like, the let the free market dictate, man. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's why they're so full of shit when they say stuff like that. <laughs> you know, because the end result of, in addition to to you know full on fascism, but the end result of capitalism is you know one or two, maybe three conglomerates owning everything, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that's what happens. They get bigger. You know, we have antitrust laws in the United States, although they're garbage, right? That are supposed mm-hmm. to prevent monopolies, right, from happening, but it still does, right? Like Well, it's like it's worse than that too because in the United States we have like an illusion of choice. So like right. I've made this point before, right? So like you walk into the grocery store and you're like, "Oh, cool. Like I have like 40 different boxes of cereal that I can choose from." Oh, but wait, they're all owned by three companies. Right. Yeah, it's not a, <laughs> it's not a choice. It's not really a choice. Just what flavor you want your corn pops to be, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um which which brand do you want to poison your children? Yeah. Yeah. And I it, the It wouldn't be it wouldn't be funny if it just like it's funny, but it's also not just because it's so yeah. fucking tragic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, and the idea that capitalism breeds innovation. No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> Why does every all the cars look the same? They <laughs> all SUVs look the same. Doesn't matter the <laughs> brand, right? Like every every neighborhood looks the same too. Right. Like exactly. fucking suburbs. Like all the same. Every single house is like a Levitt yes. town from the fifties. A hundred percent. You know. Totally. <laughs> There's yep. like no trees. Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. I <laughs> years ago, uh, I was an electrician, and we worked on some pretty pretty high end homes in the area, and they were in these giant sprawling neighborhoods, right, where you cut down all the trees and name the roads after them. <laughs> right arboretum drive and oak oak street and you know whatever other dumb name they can come up with right but it's like <laughs> there was one one house we were working on in particular that looked was totally different in style than the rest mm-hmm. of them and color and they had to fight for the color they wanted because the homeowners association which is just another group of fascists wouldn't let them have the color they wanted you have like four <laughs> colors of tan you can pick from. Oh my and god! White. Yeah, don't even get me started on fucking so HOAs. Yeah, it's so stupid. It's so <laughs> stupid. And that was the most interesting house in the whole neighborhood. Yeah. Like if I was going to live in that neighborhood, that's the house I'd want to live in. Either that or the other guy that got busted for selling drugs in that neighborhood. In this, <laughs> in this giant house, I was like, yeah. <laughs> at a boy there's two people i would hang out with in this neighborhood none of the rest of these rich bastards <laughs> yeah i just have like a, a little short summary but sure it, yeah if you guys have anything else that you want to say um just trying to think um i don't have anything else off the top of my head I'm going to do some skimming here because I think I missed something. Yeah, and I I fucked up reading a little bit because for some reason when I printed this out, it was a little bit, the text was a little bit smaller than I anticipated. So Mm. sorry about that. Hopefully it was somewhat coherent. Yeah, no, it sounded great, man. It sounded good (laughs) for sure. 100%. So yeah, just um, kind of Emma Goldman's impact on anarchism and some final thoughts that I had was she played a pivotal role in the development of anarchist political philosophy in North America and Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And her influence on anarchism and feminism cannot be understated. 
She fought to destroy all forms of systemic oppression for her entire life, and she remains an intellectual idol of many associated with radical leftist politics, particularly within the school of anarchism. So yeah, that's the queen. Yeah, no, that's really <laughs> great, man. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, she sounds awesome, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah, she was a badass. The fact that she was moving all over, you know, Europe and the United and North America, basically, right? Yeah. Like, just um, my guess is because if she she went to Canada, because if she would have went back to the United States, they would have tried to lock her up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She couldn't go to the United States. Um, all right. So I want to say thank you to both of you guys uh, for joining me. Jordan, thank you for putting this all together. Um, this is fantastic for me, informational for me. I learned a lot. I enjoyed this. Um, I see Camilla's not on, but thank you for, for coming on and listening, Camilla. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to come back on. Thanks again, man. Yeah. Um, I've got all kinds of things that occupy my brain and that I would love to expand on. And I'm just like that kind of like nerd where I love researching things. So anytime awesome. you want me to come on and just fucking ramble, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. That does it for the show. Don't forget to rate and review on whichever platform you use to listen. Special thanks to Nick Josephs for the use of the theme song. You can find Nick on Spotify and on the web at nickjosephs.com. You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you'd like to support the show, you can subscribe on patreon.com slash voices from the left or donate on buymeacoffee.com slash voices from the left. All the links will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening and solidarity. Solidarity.